é com grande prazer então que vamos ouvir o professor Johannes Engemuller. Donc, quand vous voulez partager et commencer votre conférence, à vous. Agradeço aos organizadores por me terem convidado, a Matilde, a Isabel, Helena, Teresa, Carla, a Ruth e Inês. Muito, muito obrigado pela organização deste evento. Vocês são uma equipe maravilhosa. É um grande prazer estar aqui e descobrir o trabalho que se faz em Portugal. Tenho mantido contato regular com meus colegas e amigos no Brasil e estou muito interessado em aprender mais sobre as discussões lusófonas. Em minha apresentação, irei desenvolver um modelo socio-enunciativo de subjetividade para preencher a lacuna entre a linguística e a sociologia. Vou recorrer à linguística da subjetividade e aplicá-la a exemplos do discurso de Brexit. Eu entendo o português escrito mais ou menos, uh, mas não falo facilmente e não posso seguir as conversas. Uh, espero que me perdoem se eu, se, se eu agora falar em inglês. And I will just uh, put on the PowerPoint. Where do I do that? Oh, here. As much as figures such as Trump and Bolsonaro have been threatening democracies around the world, they have also made sure that we discourse analysts are not going to run out of work anytime soon. Indeed, there's a wealth of discursive material that raises the question of how power is exercised through um, language. Yet how do we account for the effects of language on the social world? This is certainly a very old question and it's raised again and again now in contemporary um, culture wars. Extreme positions, especially from the far right, are fueled by identity issues and ongoing struggles for recognition. Today's populist discourses are often driven by a desire to boost one's subject position against somebody else. So the key problem nowadays, in these discourses at least, is how do participants achieve their subject positions? And subjectivity has both linguistic and social components. Linguists know that language defines the speaker's relationship, uh, the stance, attitude, affect toward the world. Yet at the same time, the subject positions that are created and negotiated through language are also an object of social struggles. While people use language in order to make themselves visible, they also participate in social practices of producing and reproducing the social order. And the social actors they shape, and they're also shaped by a social order where people and things are placed in certain hierarchies of value. In the following, I will discuss how political subjectivities are enacted through utterances and how utterances relate to the Brexit antagonism and to, to the social order more generally. I will cite examples from the Reader Forum of the Daily Mail from a year ago uh, when emotions were highest. Um, well, where's the overview here? And, um, and in the second part, I will go on to have a discussion of the linguistics of subjectivity and I will uh, discuss how to um, account for subjectivity nowadays. And I will conclude with a model that integrates uh, these various strands and, um, and approaches in a socio-enunciative model of subjectivity to account for social order as well as meaning making. Let me start with the um, example um, that I will use to um, make me myself understood. I will have a closer look at the reader forums of the Daily Mail. The Daily Mail is the leading conservative newspaper in the UK. Um, it's a Tory uh, newspaper, which was for Brexit. Um, 
It is a, a very large uh, newspaper, which has a serious journalistic uh, component. It also has not so serious um, contents um, about the royals, about uh, sports and um, all kinds of tabloid stuff. So it, it's a very large and broad uh, uh, paper. And, um, and of course, it has an online version. In the online version, you have um, the um, journalistic content that is published in the paper version and um, a newspaper uh, reader forum at the end. So if you go to the end, you will see um, um, a thread of people posting messages, commenting on, um, on the article. And of course, um, this is not a, a, a representative a public sphere. Uh, there's a trigger, which is the newspaper theme article. Um, and then there's all kinds of reaction. And sometimes there's more reactions and sometimes there's um, less reaction. In the case of Brexit, uh, we can see there's all, all, always thousands of reactions. So it's a very hot topic. And um, if, if you have a look at how this uh, article was framed, EU demands that that is certain to uh, trigger all kinds of reactions right away. So um, what you see here is um, um, a long list of all kinds of posts, and um, it is quite difficult to read through, uh, even though I must say it's, um, it's entertaining because you see all kinds of um, innovative, uh, inventive and uh, funny, uh, funny language. And um, the problem, of course, is that this is um, not a coherent, uh, structured, crafted text. It is um, a long list of random posts. And um, what you see is a kind of patchwork textuality. So you can read through, um, you see all kinds of um, different slogans. Um, there's an impression of, of a text, um, all this together. Um, the forum um, has uh, 5,000 comments here. And, um, and so you can read it as a text, uh, but you never know who's the author because every post, of course, points to somebody else. And, um, and since uh, the names are avatars, which might not point to real people, there's no responsibility. Uh, there's no filter for emotions. People can just express themselves. So um, it's, um, it's a quite um, interesting way to um, see unfiltered uh, reactions to, to some triggers. And this forum is hardly um, moderated. Uh, there's some sort of algorithm to, um, to filter out the most uh, obscene um, insults, but there's definitely no, um, no, no human moderation. So um, people can just uh, post uh, basically whatever and, um, and, and, um, and make themselves clear. So this is an interesting um, um, platform for an interesting type of text that is uh, constructed here. And, um, and the question is how it works. Well, it works, first of all, as I said, um, the author is very unclear. There's little auctorial responsibility. So um, there's one post after the other, and, um, and it's not quite clear uh, whether there's uh, many different um, people behind machines, um, groups, uh, whatever. Uh, the other thing is, and that's very interesting, it is um, very, very uh, clear who it is addressed to. And let's have a look here at, um, at three examples. The first one is from Kelly and Keys. I mean, of course, we don't know whether this is the real name from Kent. And um, she says, if that's the person, the Brexiteer counties should become a separate nation of Brexitania and leave, I just need to move here something, and leave the rest of the UK to thrive. Long live the UK. And the second one here is, the Ramona trolls are out in force today, still aghast that they didn't win the referendum or the general election. Boo, bloody who? Now, um, I probably won't have the time to go into these, the cultural specifics, the background to explain all these citations. I'll try to focus on the important stuff. I mean, what we can see here definitely is um, there's a very strong intersubjective uh, dimension. There's um, always a collective other that is addressed by these posts. So um, while the author is very weak and very um, um, fuzzy, um, the addressee is very clear. And um, it is either a Brexiteer or a Ramona. I mean, let's say for 60 or 70% of, um, of these posts. And, um, 
And people make it very clear how they address uh, the respective other. Uh, in, in many cases, they don't use, of course, Brexiteer or Ramona, and, um, uh, but, but it's still quite clear. And uh, what we can see here is a great deal of inventiveness, of course. Um, there's insults, aggression, but there's also a great deal of playfulness, of irony, sarcasm, uh, lots of, um, lots of word plays. Um, of course, Brexiteer and Ramona, uh, word plays. Brexiteer comes from musketeers, uh, which resonates with the buccaneering imagery of um, the Brexit um, ideology. And uh, Ramona um, uh, rhymes uh, with moan and remain. Um, so um, it is to criticize uh, the Remain people uh, for not having uh, accepted the defeat in the 2016 referendum. So um, we see a very clear uh, kind of um, addressee structure. And uh, if we have a look here as, uh, at one of these um, longer posts, there are sometimes little stories that are told, which I think are quite nice. In a shock move, 68% of the people have Sunderland have chopped off their left legs despite EU safety recommendations that this is dangerous. No EU bureaucrats can gonna stop me hopping, said retired welder Ken Mackin. That's of course an invented name. If I want to hop, I'll hop. The EU denied having demanded any such thing, but Ken insists that wealthy ex-banker Nurgle Forage assured him this was true. And Nurgle Forage, of course, is um, a joke with uh, Nigel Farage, which is um, the leading voice of um, the Brexit movement. Um, and, um, and this is obviously um, a quite uh, funny post from a Romana. And um, you see that uh, there's a whole imagery that is constructed and there's a very clear idea of who are the um, uh, Brexiteers and who are the Ramonas. And um, they basically, they, um, they're really locked in, in this big antagonism. So I won't um, uh, repeat um, the major characteristics of, um, of this forum. <clears throat> and um, I, I want to theorize this a bit and um, think about what we can learn from it. I mean, this example I think is, is, um, is a very good one. I mean, Brexit discourse, because it has really changed the social world. It has created subjectivity, subject positions, that have led to structural change. I mean, um, the statehood has been redefined, um, legal um, rules have been um, um, abolished, um, new ones have been created. Um, and there's a whole new idea of how to understand the British public sphere um, between two sides, which is um, the Brexiter uh, versus the Ramona uh, side. And this is, of course, uh, still ongoing. It's deeper than ever. And, um, and this is not just um, a knowledge that we have about um, some people um, saying something or having some values out there. It, um, it really changes the way that we understand British society, uh, which used to, to be marked by a strong um, class divide between um, uh, the upper and, and the lower classes. It still is, of course. Uh, but now there's uh, a new Brexit divide uh, which uh, which redefines those identities uh, in, in certain ways. And um, um, according to the latest polls, the Brexit divide is the most um, um, important uh, identity um, um, uh, issue in the UK. It is more important than the division between left and right, between Tory and, 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 and Labour. People uh, primarily see themselves as either pro-European or pro-Brexit. And... Um, and um, that, that means that um, the idea of society is changing as, um, as, as a social space where there are two big uh, collective actors which can't be ignored. And this, of course, um, will have long-term effects on the way um, that um, not only politics works um, in the public sphere, but also how uh, perhaps groups, um, social relationships are uh, organized. And of course, I mean, this this has uh, very deep and serious effects on personal relationships as well. I mean, uh, families have been um, um, have been torn uh, apart uh, by this and um, and uh, many other such things. So this is a real kind of change of social structural relationships, and I think that's I think really what uh, what is important. And what I want to to discuss in the following is how to understand a subjectivity as the key. 
um, missing link to understand what's happening in the language field and in the society field so that we get um, an understanding how the two are articulated through subjectivity. And um, what I will do is in the next part is to go through um, some um, history. Uh, I mean, I, I guess that most of you um, you're perfectly aware of, so it's probably a repetition, but I, I still, still want to, uh, to give you an overview to um, give you an idea of how to re-articulate it um, uh, today. So, of course, um, the key problem that I'm discussing here is the relationship of language to social structure. And um, that's um, the main um, central question of um, critical discourse analysis, of course. And um, critical discourse analysis has, has a lot of um, work on that, um, including Tun van Dyck's socio-cognitive approach about texts being um, a mediation between social structures and the knowledge that people have about um, social um, um, uh, knowledge and, uh, and the actors. And, and, and um, I think that's, um, that's a very important point. Um, I will, I'll come back to that. And um, the problem with CDA is that normally there's no real um, social analysis uh, about um, the, the social structural realities uh, which are given, uh, are presented as a given. Um, there's a tendency in CDA to uh, side with realist sociological models um, that understand uh, power relationships, antagonisms like this one here as determining um, to um, action, to actors. And, um, and that's something that um, invites um, many discourse analysts not to really um, kind of have a closer look at how social structures are constituted in social practices and how social practices are in turn shaped by, um, by social structure, which I think is um, um, the question that we should address if we want to go a bit further. Um, that's why I want to go back to a figure which is maybe no longer very, very uh, present, Michel Pecheux, um, who is um, a linguist philosopher from France, of course, um, the founder of what's sometimes called the French School of Discourse Analysis, um, and of course, he too had a very kind of realistic, um, realist idea of society, namely as, as class struggle. Um, he also had um, a very structuralist idea of, um, um, of language. And you may wonder why, why go back to Michel Pecheux? And um, I think for two reasons. One thing is he really looked into the relationship between utterances and social antagonisms. He pointed out um, that that utterances were embedded in social formations and, um, and ultimately in, in larger collective uh, groups and, um, and power relationships. Um, the second thing is, and I think that's even more important, um, and I think a good um, entry into the problematic is that he put a great deal of emphasis on the question of subjectivity. And um, he's um, the father of um, theorizing around subject positions, the way that uh, language is used to define subject positions in a society, establish subject positions uh, that make a difference where things can be said um, and, um, and, uh, and done. And, um, and to understand the way how the social structure is articulated in uh, linguistic practices um, that turn around subject positions. Um, he has, of course, um, a whole critical stance towards uh, the notion of um, subject positions and subjectivity. Um, his main work is in la, Les Vérités de la Palisse from 1975. And um, I just uh, cite him here, la capacité à dire moi un tel. And I still need to move you. I'm sorry, I, I, I have a little... Um, video here, and I don't see my screen, so I say it again. La capacité à dire moi un tel est présentée comme une évidence première. Il est évident, et les apotrophes euh, sont très importantes ici, hein. il est évident que je suis le seul qui puisse dire moi en parlant de moi-même. Um, so what he says, basically, subjectivity is um, a kind of um, ideology, a socially um, established a format, an institution uh, that allow people to, um, to understand, to feel, to, to say who they are through um, um, the pronoun I. 
and um, and uh, of course his point is to to critically interrogate um, the way that people are placed in the social structure through this um, eye effect, the subjectivity effect, and um, and see through uh, these um, uh, these mechanisms that make people think um, according to the place that they occupy in in society. Now, um, in linguistics, and um, I want to 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 see Pesheu as a visionary um, to make the plea for for the um, connection between linguistic and social theory. Uh, if we if we have a closer look at linguistics, of course, um, that idea of the I as being uh, the origin of subjectivity goes back to Benveniste, and um, and um, that's uh, that's very clear. Uh, but I want to say what's not so clear is there is a German linguist behind. Karl Bühler, who's never cited for some reason. I think he, he, he spoke a strange language, which nobody understands. And, um, and basically, um, B uh, Benveniste never um, uh, re revealed his source, which was Bühler, clearly. And, um, and Bühler was um, a social psychologist uh, slash linguist who, um, um, who investigated uh, language as, as a kind of um, human um, activity of placing oneself in the symbolic field and also in the didactic field. So he was one of the first forceful voices to point out that language is not just uh, used to convey some concepts, some um, semantic contents, uh, but, uh, but especially as well, um, it allows people to position themselves as selves in, in, in the world. And that's of course totally fundamental to the whole field of the linguistics of subjectivity, which we nowadays um, uh, associate with uh, Benveniste. And um, I just cite from, from Bühler, there's an English uh, translation nowadays, uh, which I'm, I'm not sure is that, uh, that good, but still, I mean, it's, it's a good first entry. Uh, the didactic field of language and direct verbal exchange is the here now I system of subjective orientation. The sender and the receiver are constantly within this orientation on which basis they understand the gestures and directive clues of demonstratio ad oculus, of I um, cues, I would say, yeah. So I, I'll get back to that. I think that's a very important point about the I, um, that is the viewing um, angle that, um, uh, that is instituted through um, the didactic center. Um, now, I want to point out here two branches of the linguistics of subjectivity which has uh, involved, evolved um, in the wake of Emile Benveniste's um, uh, works from the 1960s and 70s. Um, there's a French branch which has developed um, very actively um, since the 1970s, and there's an English language linguistics which has developed. And um, it's quite amazing to see that um, they're totally unaware of each other, um, um, as always when you cross languages. And uh, this is, of course, not only because uh, people don't speak the other language. I mean, I guess linguists have normally a quite good um, grasp of languages, but it's really about translating uh, concepts um, and uh, terms, which is so difficult, and especially in linguistics. So um, what we see, we have these different bubbles uh, coexisting uh, side by side. And um, I, um, I think it's uh, very important to have a look at uh, what's happening in these other languages. And I think we, we should really have much more reflection on the translation of these things. Um, there's obviously uh, a big language barrier between French and English and German, um, but uh, I guess that uh, between French and, um, and the Romance languages, the barrier is much lower because you can always um, um, uh, use um, enoncé, um, Inusiar, um, uh, the Latin word of, um, of, um, of, of, of say, communicate, uh, which is impossible, of course, in English. And so that changes, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, a lot. So we need to um, enter very different terminological worlds. And I want to um, uh, summarize some uh, developments um, of um, French and um, English linguistics. And I, I won't go into the details. I just want to say there's, of course, as everywhere, there are always um, uh, some different um, um, specialists from other language spheres. Uh, there has been some speech act theory from the Anglo-Saxon Anglo world. 
um, there has been some interactionism from North America. Um, and then there is, I think, uh, something which is more specific for France, perhaps the social pragmatics, um, uh, which one can perhaps associate with uh, Charodot and uh, Magnot, uh, uh, who are interested in the pragmatic dimension of, um, of language in their social historical contexts and to understand um, how to count for meaning making as, um, as a social historically uh, situated activity. Um, the um, interesting thing for our uh, talk here, I think, is there's an um, increasing development interest in decentering uh, the question of uh, subjectivity. And um, if we have a look at the original citation from Benveniste here, le langage n'est possible que parce que chaque locuteur se pose comme sujet en renvoyant à lui-même comme jeu dans son discours. We still have an idea which is very much centered on the human as a generic source, right? As, as a source of meaning. Um, so language is seen as, um, as, as pointing back to um, um, meaning making of the human um, uh, subject. So we have that very um, generic kind of idea of um, subjectivity, whereas in, in the more recent um, developments uh, since the 80s and 90s, um, we definitely see that subjectivity is more or less more and more um, decentered into all kinds of layers. Um, uh, I mean, since the 70s, um, uh, various linguists have um, emphasized the, um, um, the opacity of, uh, of enunciation and of texts. Uh, which is because there's there's a layering of enunciative um, of voices and um, and perspectives which do not refer back to one human source of meaning making, right? So there's um, an orchestration of all kinds of different voices, which um, makes it a very heterogeneous experience to use utterances. And um, and if if we have a look at Pechou, who in no way was was very sympathetic with enunciation theory, uh, but I think at the end he definitely opened up um, and he became quite um, uh, interested in the notion of heterogeneity, which has um, become very important uh, for people like Autier um, and uh, Ducrot and, um, and, uh, and, and, and later on uh, Stapolin, the Scandinavian theory of polyphony. And, and here the idea is that whenever we um, put utterances to work, we refer to different um, instances of, um, of, 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 um, of viewing uh, at the same time, of, of saying at the same time. And these instances uh, might conflict with each other. Um, that's why um, um, utterances are seen in their opacity. Um, and, um, and it's important to allocate the different voices, enunciators, locutors, to the right um, speakers and not to get lost in, in this kind of um, concert, um, this dialogical um, spectacle of um, different um, perspectives and points of, view, point, points of view that are always opened up. Um, so I think um, that's a one um, development which of course um, uh, refers to Miguel Bakhtin, um, 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 and it's an application of uh, Bakhtin's um, theory of polyphony um, to the level of the utterance in linguistics. And, um, and then if we have a look at, um, at the English language um, linguistics that has followed um, Emile Berveniste, or that claims Emile Berveniste, because obviously I think uh, these people never really read uh, much of, I mean, some exceptions, um, uh, but most didn't really read uh, lots of French uh, linguistics, um, and nor did uh, the French ones, I, don't know, I must say. And, um, and so um, we have um, Lyons, um, who is the kind of uh, linguistics that is very close to, to Berminist um, and um, coming out of, um, of Chomsky. Um, there's um, uh, some uh, work around subjectification, um, the idea that uh, the more certain uh, expressions get grammat grammaticalized, um, the more subjective they become. This is the idea from Traugott. But what I want to point out here, and what's important for our purpose here, is um, there's a turn towards um, the cognitive dimension of uh, language use. And now that's, I think, a very interesting uh, development that res resonates a lot 
with Cullioli in France, even though there hasn't been uh, much, um, much overlap um, in terms of exchange, I guess. And um, I think um, the uh, Cullioli school, and you've heard uh, one of the representatives yesterday, um, uh, would see many things uh, kind of very close to, um, uh, to, to, to the ideas of enunciator and co-enunciator in Langeke, for example, who is one of the initiators of cognitive grammar. And so um, the idea is to um, model cognitive operations um, and to understand um, uh, the, um, the situation that is modeled uh, from the uh, linguistic material that triggers certain, um, certain cognitive um, um, processes. Now, that, that definitely sounds very much like Kuliji. I'm, I'm sure that Langenker didn't, um, never heard of Kuliji. Um, the other thing is, um, I will maybe go to the next slide, uh, is Chilton, who, um, who builds on Benveniste more explicitly um, to, um, um, to, um, to point out that Dykes is not only at work in, in the concrete personal situation, but also metaphorically. So whenever we, um, we use utterances, um, we set a didactic center, a here, now, and I, from where uh, the didactic space is projected. And that can be, of course, um, also a very uh, metaphoric space. This can be a social space as well. And um, so this is a fundamental um, operation um, that, uh, that is done whenever we engage in meaning making. Um, I don't think we have the time and, and that we have to um, look uh, further into these models, which can be, of course, extremely technical. But, um, but what you can see here is in Langeke, you have um, the C for the conceptualizer, which is um, uh, his expression for the locutor um, in Ducro. And um, his model basically tries to, to capture um, cognitive uh, representations of movement. Uh, his example here, for example, is um, um, uh, the girl uh, runs across the street, um, which is different. Um, the movement is, is different from um, um, I run across the street because um, uh, if the girl runs from there, from her place to some, some uh, reference point uh, across the street, um, the movement is uh, different, uh, is, is conceptualized differently than from, from my point. And um, he, um, he points out that these, um, these movements and uh, ideas of movements are very present and important in all kinds of um, 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 linguistic phenomena. And um, uh, he, he tries to um, represent those different um, ways of, of expressing movement uh, here in this, um, in, this, uh, in this table. Let me get back to the example now. And... Um, and flag up some of the things that, um, that we've heard theoretically to um, remind you that, uh, of course, these things are all highly relevant in the way that we can uh, analyze the, um, the patchwork text of the thread in, in the forum. Because if, if we don't really have a strong author, we still have all kinds of um, linguistic cues that help us um, um, determine the different voices, the subjectivity involved, and also the didactic space and the movement and, uh, that is conceptualized um, here in the context. And um, I, I give you here these two um, posts, which I, I think are quite, um, quite typical in the way that they um, um, mobilize certain resources here. The first one is from No More Donny, Republic of England, not A. United Kingdom. Republic of England already is a clue that this might not be a very conservative person, right? Um, so um, no more Donny says, not exactly going well, is it? Taking back control yet, Brexiteers. So again, we see the very strong intersubjective interpolation, right? Again, I mean, um, the person that is addressed is a collective imaginary other. Um, almost nobody here. I mean, there's some uh, direct uh, dialogue in the forum. I mean, people can, can react to each other to some degree, but most of the people um, interact with that collective imaginary other, the Brexiteer or the Ramona, um, that they have a very clear idea of, 
um, and um, I'm, I'm sure that um, that uh, that is uh, not a person that that you can can have a drink with. Um, so uh, this this collective other here is it addressed through um, through Brexit here, of course. And um, and the interesting theory is uh, the polyphony. Not exactly going well, is it? There's stands through well. I mean, uh, somebody saying something positive from his point of view um, about something which refers obviously um, to um, people expecting uh, Brexit leading to um, some sunny uplands, as the Ramonas would say. So that is um, the promises of, of a liberated um, nation that uh, could, could be free of the shackles of Brussels bureaucrats and, and, um, and keep their money. And, um, and so we have here polyphony through the negator, not, yeah, because um, there's the reference to some implicit voice here, some, some generic social other, um, a kind of established voice out there in public space, uh, which, um, presuppose, which is presupposed. Um, and that voice says, it is going well with Brexit, uh, which of course is then rejected by the Donny locuteur. And, um, and so uh, the stance that is expressed, um, the positive stance towards Brexit is, um, is rejected through the polyphonic subjectivity. And, um, and the other thing is, and that's also, that, uh, that points to the um, um, heterogeneity of, um, of the text here. Uh, there's a citation, taking back control was one of the slogans of the Brexit campaign. So um, he um, or she cites taking back control, reframes it and um, kind of uh, turns it against the Brexiteers. And, um, and all of that with a strong idea of movement, right? Not exactly going well. There's a clear idea of, of a movement in, in, in the cognitive space here, as well as um, yet um, I mean, basically, it doesn't really show um, the, the trajectory of that movement uh, in Lengerke's terms, but um, but you can see that um, uh, what uh, what what uh, uh, taking back control uh, now and here uh, refers to some implicit movement, a process that has led to the current situation, and um, and um, I think the whole idea of of movement process is very important for Brexit discourse. It's about commenting. On a, on an idea of of a social of social change that people have um, with the antagonism of Brexit and Ramona, and um, and it is of course key to um, um, to frame the the movement in the right way. So just to give you an example of a Brexit voice here, uh, a little below, stay out of our business. We left. Remember, and this is of course a very strongly. Um, didactic, um, didactically organized space. And um, I mean, I find it again interesting. Um, the situation here now is, is defined through the end point of the trajectory, right? We left. And, and those who have made it there, they, they are then presented as we. And, um, and from, from that point, of course, it is clear that that we does not include everybody. Um, it, is, it includes the national uh, Britons um, and not the traitors, not um, the uh, pro-EU people. Um, and um, it is a very um, antagonistic way of dividing the social space and the imaginary of, of a public sphere between Remainers and, um, and Brexiters. And, um, and again, of course, uh, we see here with very few resources, people are able to participate in that patchwork text of a forum, uh, which is very much centered on these very towering um, subject positions of the Brexiteer and the Ramona, who are always interpolated through these little um, posts and messages uh, uh, across um, the, the thread. And that's how there's um, some unity of, of the text. And that's how people can, can have some, some, some meaningful um, intervention here, because um, they're kind of bound by that very strong, um, strongly established antagonism, which is not necessarily present, uh, like it is flagged up here through um, the address, but it's, um, it's definitely, um, I mean, in the minds of everybody here. So um, it is um, not possible to ignore as, um, as a social reality um, um, uh, embedding the text. 
Okay, so I've talked about um, some developments in the linguistics of subjectivity. I will say about a few words about um, the sociological discussion about um, subjectivity, agency, actors, and social structures, just to give you um, um, a quick idea how uh, another disciplinary debate um, can and should be articulated with our linguistic debate. Um, and uh, I, I, I say that because um, in Peshur and also in CDA, there's normally the idea of a very strong um, external um, real um, structure that determines um, linguistic and social practice. And, um, and I think it's important to, to see the practice turn in the social sciences uh, that, um, that has been operated over the last few decades, where the idea of, I mean, the over overwhelming majority of, of social scientists is to account for social structures in terms of practices, to understand how many people work, interact together, um, bringing forth structures. Um, in many cases, of course, they're not intended. It's not a conscious um, project of, of anybody to, um, um, to uh, produce um, inequalities of wealth, of power. Uh, but at the end of the day, many people will have done certain things so that um, only a few people can really um, uh, influence uh, many others. And what I want to say is to, um, to just give you um, um, some idea here about uh, the different uh, dimensions and levels that we could uh, address. There is um, the level of the actor um, and there's uh, the level of the structure. And, um, and the question is how actors um, are constituted, um, named, uh, made um, relevant as persons in, in the social um, space. Um, and, um, and they will um, interact with many other actors over time, um, um, sometimes um, um, articulate uh, alliances, connections um, in informations. Um, I mean, the Brexit camp will be articulated with other political positions, for example, if we follow um, the Laclau Mouffe uh, model. And so there will be a tendency to, um, to, to create order, right, uh, along a certain antagonism, which nowadays in the UK is between pro and anti-Brexit. And, um, and over time, there's more and more elements, um, people, ideas, um, resources uh, mobilized by that antagonism. And, um, and it will um, structure uh, more and more areas of a social space. So that's the idea of, um, of, um, of, of a social space of, of, um, of, of practices. And I saw there was a hands up is um, their question. I'm very happy to, to take your question now. Was it Elsa? No question? Okay. Um, let me um, kind of wrap it up now with a model that I'd like to uh, present here. And, um, and uh, I'd, I'd suggest um, that we, well, uh, throw the two uh, um, debates together <laughs> to be very uh, um, uh, uh, sloppy in my, my words. Um, but the point is um, we, can, we can articulate them through the notion of subjectivity. Because in a way, what happens is in the linguistic um, space of meaning making, um, there's um, different flaws, different dimensions of meaning making. There, there are lots of things that go on on, on subconscious levels and, um, and linguists um, are so good to, 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 to discover um, the many voices, mechanisms, um, um, uh, processes, operations. Uh, that usually uh, happen at lightning speed. This is something that, that happens totally spontaneously for people who have the competence. And, um, and as we read along um, the forum, um, there's a certain reduction of that complexity. And um, if we apply the um, uh, model of uh, linguistic polyphony, um, we can see here three floors. Uh, on the first floor, uh, readers deal with all kinds of points of view, uh, coming from all kinds of sites, and it's not immediately clear 
um, how to attribute the different things that are said, the contents, the propositional contents to different positions in discourse, right? That's precisely what the markers of polyphony um, will tell us about. So um, uh, the second floor will be to, um, to sort um, the different points of views and perspectives so that they're all kind of um, grouped together under um, the locator and the many other instances that we understand um, will uh, represent those uh, perspectives. And on the last level, um, the many um, um, locutors and allocutors, they're grouped together again under even bigger uh, subject positions that, um, that uh, encompass all kinds of different voices that we have immediately forgotten. So um, when we read, we, uh, we immediately forget the micro um, positioning, right? That, uh, that takes place on, on the level of, um, of the utterance. Uh, what we, we take out of the text is what certain subject positions are supposed to say or what uh, they're supposed to be. And this is a process of reduction. And, um, and this is something that, um, that basically determines what um, different participants of the discourse are supposed to be responsible for. And this is, of course, much less complex than what happens on the most um, minute level of um, um, enunciative operations, right? And so this is the highest level here in, in my model of uh, meaning making, which of course relates to cognitive context and uh, we can place it uh, within the didactic uh, world uh, from where um, things make sense and um, uh, we can determine the movements, the kind of developments in, in, that, uh, in that didactic space. Uh, but this is all about how to account for meaning making. And it is not really about for how to account the creation of social order, which is a different space. And, um, and the different space, um, as, I, as I said, um, has two um, kind of um, uh, problems to solve. On the one hand, um, to achieve actorhood. And this is by giving names to, to certain people or instances that, that are seen as uh, able to act in, in the social world. I mean, in, in our world, it's mostly humans, of course. Um, and, um, and they are subject to certain structures, which they in turn um, bring forth. So um, this is um, something that, um, uh, that needs actors and people who, who are presented as subjects. If they're not uh, part of a meaning-making world uh, where it's clear who says what and thinks what and says what and does what, um, the actors wouldn't exist. So subjectivity, social enunciative subjectivity is key to understand um, these processes in both cases, right? And, and they're of course uh, linked. If, if, if we have a great antagonism, which, um, which is established over years, this will uh, of course affect um, meaning making to some degree. So it's not something which is outside, it is linked, it is articulated. And um, the difference to um, the Halliday model, which, um, which is of course the background in, in CDA uh, in many cases, I mean, at least Fairclough and uh, most others, uh, for Fairclough, um, society is part of a cognitive context. It's a resource that we need to make sense of texts, but it's not uh, something that we need to explain in terms of how order is, um, is achieved. Um, so um, I definitely agree um, that, um, that we have all kinds of ideas and knowledge about the society that we mobilize in order to, to understand texts and, and utterances. Um, but it's a different question uh, from asking how um, certain things which are established in meaning making as subject positions are then um, um, used and, and, um, um, uh, and how, how these things then feed into uh, social practices of, um, of creating social order. And, um, and a last word here on this model to, um, um, to, to understand it a bit better. Um, I mean, usually there's just the um, big area of subjectivity, uh, including hegemony of social formations, which is more or less visible. This is what people are really interested in. And that's uh, why they use language to make themselves visible. And that's why they engage in social practices, right? Um, they want to defend their social position in the social space. And, um, and that needs resources and competition and, 
um, it's a very existential thing um, to make sure that um, you get recognized as a subject in the social world as well. So this is um, what everybody's focused on and people have a fine sense um, to understand how people are represented and um, um, how people should be represented. And then there's um, these other areas, which I think is our task to make visible uh, the hidden area of social structures, which are mobilized in social action. Um, I mean, we see that this is very important and this exists in, in the way that some actors can, um, can impose uh, their agendas and others not. Uh, so there's a huge um, asymmetry between actors. And at the same time, we know as linguists, there's so much happening below the conscious level of, um, of meaning making that needs to be um, unpacked and um, descripted. Um, and, um, and that's exactly what, um, what, uh, what we can contribute to, to, uh, to reveal the mechanisms and processes um, to make sure that what um, seems evident um, can be understood. I want to come to my conclusion after this um, talk and say a few things. Um, the most important thing is, of course, behind all, all of that, never forget that, there's a German linguist. Um, my second point is um, subjectivity is an interdisciplinary problem because it refers to these two areas of sociology or social sciences and linguistics and, and, and formal um, knowledge um, at the same time. And uh, it is very difficult um, to um, account for it. I don't think that Pichu gave um, the final answer to that, but he definitely posed the problem um, in a kind of very um, powerful way. And um, I, I want to invite uh, people to go, go on with that. I think for most non-linguists, the idea of language being constitutive for subjectivity is quite a new insight. Most people, as I said, um, think of language as, as, as a kind of instrument to, to convey some ideas and contents. Um, they don't see that, um, that we are constituted through language as subjects. And that's something um, that uh, we as linguists um, can contribute to and um, open the eyes um, uh, to people who, who, um, who don't see how, how fundamental um, um, language is to us as subjects. However, we should also always be quite critical of that whole idea of subjectivity. There's no natural subjectivity. There's nothing um, um, natural waiting uh, out there that needs to be expressed in terms of some inner experience or some, some um, subjective um, 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 perception that, uh, that is true or, 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 or important. Subjectivity is also a political problem. And we see the problem in the debates um, of our culture wars today, where people are really entrenched, locked into very kind of rigid um, subject positions. Um, they're no longer able to, to have some normal conversation across um, the divides. And um, I think uh, that's because uh, language has worked way too well. And we should be careful. We should not only open the eyes to people and, and point uh, this problem out to them, that this is a very linguistic problem, but we should also help um, uh, going beyond um, these, um, these very kind of rigid um, subject positions and make sure they don't take themselves too seriously. Thank you very much. And there's um, a little publicity about myself here because um, it's in, in Portuguese. But this is a different, I mean, this is, the book is about um, the French pragmatic um, um, tradition of, um, of, of enunciation and uh, polyphony. And um, it's not, not really about uh, what, what I talked here. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Johannes and Gurmuller. Now we have time to discuss and I think we can make the discussion in Portuguese, French or English. Nous avons maintenant le temps donc de, bah de, de poser quelques questions, de discuter à propos de cette riche conférence, que ce soit en français, en portugais ou en anglais. Nous avons le temps pour, pour colocar des questions et discuter et agradecer une fois de plus cette, cette conférence extrêmement stimulante et riche du professeur Johanna sanger -Muller.
Antónia, levantaste a mão. <risos> Obrigada, sim, há sempre a necessidade de quebrar aqui o gelo na fase das perguntas. So, thanks very much for your uh, presentation, for your conference. If you don't mind, perhaps I would uh, speak in French. It's easier for me. No problem, I think. <laughs> so, um, alors, merci encore une fois de votre présentation. Moi, j'ai juste une petite curiosité, et donc je reviens plutôt au début de votre présentation, lorsque vous avez montré les deux branches de la linguistique, de la, de la subjectivité. Vous commencez avec Bühler, tout à fait d'accord, et le, enfin, l'importance de reprendre des auteurs plutôt oubliés. Mais ma question, et puis après, avec les auteurs que vous montrez là, tout à fait d'accord, pas de question là-dessus. Ma seule question, c'est de savoir pourquoi, une fois que vous parlez de towards a polyphonic, polyphonic subjectivities, pourquoi est-ce que vous ne, n'intégrez pas les contributions de Voloshinov et de Yarubinsky, euh, parole dialogale et Voloshinov, en fait, ce sont, c'est, Volosh, c'est Voloshinov qui introduit une conception euh, carrément sociale du langage. Mm-hmm. En fait, avec Bonveniste, nous avons une approche plutôt phénoménologique, enfin, euh, c'est moi celui qui parle, qui se pose en tant que tel, mais Voloshinov, c'est le langage, c'est au départ carrément social. Et, et, yeah. et là, à la fin, vous, vous, vous avez dit quelque chose pareil, euh, juste à la fin, dans le sens que nous, les humains, on se construit, on se, euh, on se fait à travers le langage, plutôt ça. Alors, moi, c'est juste une petite question... Enfin, pourquoi vous, vous, vous oubliez là les auteurs qui sont, à vrai dire, les fondateurs de, la, de l'approche dialogique et polyphonique du langage et qui, 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 qui ont une, une conception tot, dès le départ social du langage? Parce que moi aussi, ce que je me dis, c'est dans tout ça, dans les rapports langage social, il faut aussi avoir un point de vue sur le langage. Enfin, et Volonchinov, là, il dit que c'est dès le départ, c'est le social. Et c'est ça qui nous... Enfin, juste une petite curiosité, merci en tout cas. Oui, yeah, oui, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's c'est definitely, I mean, un problème de have this kind of snapshot here. Um, I mean, there's definitely many more traditions. Um, I mean, I'm not, not sure one can perhaps talk about a Russian tradition. I think it's very semiotic, I guess, if there's a tradition that um, that's also very much influenced by Saussure. Um, and um, I, I would think of the whole kind of um, um, development from uh, from the Bakhtin Falochnev um, circle in the twenties up to um, to Lotman, um, who who have worked on um, questions of of cultural meaning making um, and um, the the way that um, the cultural world is um, is organized by certain semiotic resources, and um, and of course um, uh, we could um, we could um, list here many other traditions, and I just um put in these two to remind people it's not just one discussion i mean there's other discussions there's also the german discussion um i'm i'm sure if i if i knew about the portuguese discussion uh i know a bit about the brazilian discussion it's a very um um big discourse with lots of, of voices and contributions which um Uh, have been totally crucial and um, and so um, I hope this totally goes um, in along your um, your um, point. Thanks. And Thanks again, I mean, I mean translating these things is interesting, yeah um, because um, I mean translating from Russian into French and English is not neutral at all. And there's lots of um, connotations which are lost. I think there's, for example, Slovo, um, which is important to, to Valoshinov and, um, and, and uh, Bartin. And uh, I, I think in the, um, 
translations which have been so successful in France um, because they sound so Lacanian, Bernvinistian. Um, um, they have been uh, translated by, by, by discourse. Um, and it makes perfect sense to French readers of, of these translations um, because they have read Bavinist. <laughs> and, um, but slovo uh, means also the word in the biblical sense. So it has very um, metaphysical connotations as well. But I, um, I, have, I don't have the kind of uh, subtlety uh, to, um, to really go back. But that, I think, is extremely interesting. And it would be good to make that visible and, and clear that yes. linguistics always comes in a language. Um, and, um, and all the knowledge that we have as linguists sticks to, to the la language. And we can't really translate these things easily. Yes, I, um, I agree. And Slovo, it also be translated as enoncé. <laughs> so it was very different of the um, discours. <laughs> But I think it's a very it's a very uh, good um, discussion. Um, mais alguma pergunta, algum comentário? Esta questão da subjetividade e da proposta. I'd like to. Sim, boa, boa tarde. <laughs> boa tarde. Boa tarde, José Pente Lima. Can I can I say uh, speak, speaking in, in English? Um, uh, congratulations on your on your on your communication. Uh, I I I have uh, been uh, at the German uh, Germ uh, in the German department uh, of our university, Faculdade Letras, and um, I knew about uh, Karl Bühler from, from a long time. Um, and it's 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 good to know that uh, that people are now trying to uh, how do you say uh, revisit him uh, rev revisit him. Um, I think that um, there is, however, an, another person, another linguist, who knew about sure he knew about Karl Bühler. But I don't think uh, he, he wrote uh, anything about, uh, and I'm not sure, which is Roman Jakobson. Mm -hmm. uh, jo jo Jakobson uh, knew a lot, a lot of things about Karl Bühler. And it's, it's nice to know that uh, there are people uh, that still, there is still uh, a lot of things about, about uh, history of the linguistics that we don't, uh, don't we have forgotten in a way. But uh, so I, I just uh, would like to, to, to thank you for, for, our, for, for your presentation. And uh, okay, uh, it's important to, to, to study this subject of uh, subjectivity. Another, another thing, um, there is um, another linguist, um, Gabriela Divald, who spoke Mm. spoke uh, wrote about Karl Bühler and the the, the idea of origo mm -hmm. yeah they take it they, they they exist right uh in his in her works and uh it's just another another hint yes. yeah, thank yeah. you thank you yeah yeah I think this is um, all quite um, important um, to be aware of these backgrounds. I mean, I don't want to kind of participate in erecting canonical figures here, but I, I, I'm, I'm more and more surprised to see that there's so many kind of parallel discussions um, across languages and, um, and, uh, and, and sometimes these figures help us um, get together. Yeah, I see another. Person here, Sarah. Yes, Sarah. Sarah. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour cette communication. Je, je voulais intervenir sur deux points. D'abord, vous avez fait. Je peux parler en français. Je crois quelqu'un d'autre l'a fait. Donc j'essaye ça. C'est plus facile pour moi. Je m'en excuse. Euh, vous avez parlé de, de, de la relation éventuelle entre la linguistique cognitive et Culioli, et en faisant référence à une conférence que j'ai faite hier, sur, ou quoi, où je, 
qui n'avait rien à voir avec Lully d'ailleurs, mais bon, en tant qu'Ulliolienne quand même. Et, et je voulais quand même souligner la, la grande opposition entre les, entre les, les, deux, les deux démarches, euh, opposition qui est basée… Euh, alors, je pense que Langacker n'a jamais effectivement lu et cité que le livre. Là, entendu, j'ai été présente dans des colloques où ils étaient tous les deux, donc ils se sont entendus quand même. Mais euh, que le livre, bien sûr, connaissait Langacker, mais s'y intéressait pas énormément. Et l'opposition, c'est euh, le, le, le fait de, de mettre le, le spatial et le concret au départ de tout, qui va pouvoir donner de l'abstraction par métaphorisation. Euh, que le lit, mais au départ de tout, euh, l'action, hein, l'action sur autrui, sur la, sur la pensée, mais et, 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 et les, donc euh, ne, prendrait, ne prendrait jamais, euh, et, et, et c'est cette action qui va se matérialiser dans les gestes, pardon, excusez-moi, c'est les pompiers passent, <rire> hein, je ne peux rien faire, je ne peux pas faire taire les pompiers. Non, mais entre-temps, je peux demander, Johannes, vous pouvez en fait cesser de votre présentation, comme ça on, on arrive à se voir tous et toutes, s'il vous plaît. Non, donc voilà, c'est un petit peu le débat d'ailleurs que prenait Benveniste lui-même, hein, euh, quand il, 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 il s'opposait par exemple il a, euh, à propos de, du mot euh, « tree » qui donne « truth ». Euh, et, et, et beaucoup de gens disaient au départ, quoi, ils citent des gens du début du XXe siècle qui disaient au départ il y a le sens arbre à partir duquel on a métaphorisé pour donner la vérité et, 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 et Benveniste luttait contre ça en disant au départ et il le montrait dans les textes il y a déjà une idée de solidité quoi, une idée abstraite l'abstraction d'abord et, et la complexité d'abord donc bon, c'est juste pour signaler ça mais mais plus proche de, de votre exposé et de ce qui était vraiment ce qui, ce qui était très beau dans ce que vous avez montré, la façon dont euh, dans, dans ces, ces forums se construisent euh, ce que vous avez appelé, la, la, je crois, la, la subject, une subjectivité euh, euh, dans sa dimension sociale, y compris. Moi, ce qui me semble quand même, c'est que ce qui se construit, ce n'est pas simplement la subjectivité, c'est quelque chose de moins beau, euh, qui est la division sociale, euh, voire la haine. Euh, et et d'ailleurs, une des choses, vous avez très joliment montré la polyphonie de ces, ces, ces échanges, mais ce qui est cité, euh, c'est des slogans, euh, donc, des slogans, donc des répétitions. Donc, il y a un côté euh, séd sédimentation des oppositions qui sans doute a, a pu déboucher sur des populismes terribles. Euh, il y a d'autres formes de subjectivité qui sont moins rances que celle-là, quand même. Je, non Ou, ou je, je, je force le trait. Il semble quand même qu'on voit là de la haine en marche. Le terme en marche est aussi un peu connoté en France. Pardon. <rire> Donc, je ne sais pas si vous êtes d'accord avec cette analyse. Merci beaucoup, hein. ça m'a ça fait un grand plaisir de vous voir ici et de, de discuter avec vous, avec euh, votre perspective aussi informée par Pululi, euh, que, que, que je trouve énormément inspirant. Et, euh, et donc, euh, donc, vous dites pour la première chose, Pululi part plutôt avec des notions plus euh, abstraites. C'est un peu voilà, une ontologie euh, des... Des, euh, des qualités, c'est ça un, un, un des concepts qu'il qu utilisait pas mal à la fin, en tous les cas, c'est le, le, le concept de geste mental, euh, mmh. où le mot mental est décisif. Euh, et, bon, voilà, c'est-à-dire que euh, ce n'est pas une abstraction de geste concret, c'est au, au contraire la, la pensée euh, qui est aux commandes et qui, qui nous fait aborder la réalité. Euh, bon, et, voilà. Euh, donc les, les, les gestes en question c'est des, des gestes de pensée qui nous permettent d'organiser la vie et ça je pense que c'est vraiment l'idée que l'abstraction est aux commandes de nos gestes et, non, et au lieu que ça soit euh, des, euh, au lieu, au lieu qu'il y ait le concret d'abord à partir duquel on construit, euh, on construit la pensée c'est l'inverse euh, je pense mais voilà il faudrait des exemples plus précis j'ai pas le temps, mais je crois que vraiment il y a un débat entre les deux, deux façons de prendre le cognitif. Vous avez raison, les deux sont, dans le, sont sur le terrain de bataille de la cognition, mais avec deux points de vue différents, je pense. Voilà. 
Donc, il y a une autre conception qui part de, de l'expérience plus concrète, mm. euh, de l'embodiment, euh, de voilà. comment faire euh, Embodiment en mm. français Je ne sais pas. Et, <rire> et, euh, et puis, c'est quelque chose qui, qui, qui serait inconnu à Culoli. Hein. De toute façon, en fait, euh, euh, donc, euh, Culoli, ce serait plus euh, avec une, une, une idée du. Voilà, de, de, de notre ontologique qui, 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 qui soit sous-jacent, hein, c'est ça des, 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 euh, Ok. Um, J'apprends, <rire> merci. Um, et l'autre chose sur, sur la haine qui s'exprime, um, bah en fait, c'est la grande question. Pourquoi ces, ces gens-là, ils se, um, ils se haïssent hein? um, c'est très intéressant de voir euh, les, euh, les dimensions socio-psychologiques euh, dans, dans, dans ces dynamiques actuelles. Euh, à mon avis, euh, maintenant, c'est assez clair qu'il n'y a pas tellement de différence sur le niveau des valeurs, des orientations, des, euh, euh, des préférences idéologiques. Hein. Bien sûr, il y en a. Hein. Ce n'est pas inexistant, mais dans cet antagonisme très fort et très, très marqué, il y a quand même une, une hétérogénéité incroyable des, euh, des valeurs qui, euh, qui coexistent euh, à l'intérieur de, de chaque possession de sujet. Hein. Et, euh, et on, on l'a vu avec euh, des, des résultats d'un sondage très récent. Euh, quand on demande aux gens « Est-ce que vous êtes féministe euh, ?» Il y a il y a très peu des, des, des gens de droite qui disent oui. Um, il y a beaucoup de gens de gauche ou des, 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 um, des Remainers, <rire> Remainers qui, uh, qui, qui se sentent proches de, 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 de la cause féministe. Si on demande est-ce que vous êtes d'accord pour que euh, un chauffeur, un, un contrôleur ou un, ou un ou un maçon euh, soit une femme il y a un accord unanime euh, qu'en en fait on ne peut pas permettre une discrimination donc il y a euh, une certaine euh, base empirique pour dire que finalement sur, euh, sur les idées féministes il n'y a peut-être pas vraiment tellement de différence avec, euh, entre les trumpistes et les les, 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 les gens qui, qui ont voté pour Biden, mais surtout pour le marqueur de l'identité. Donc, euh, c'est ça ce qui est intéressant, de, de voir que les gens euh, se mobilisent autour des tribus, des identités tribales, pour euh, mettre en avant leur identité, leur appartenance euh, dans le camp de Trump ou de, 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 du Brexit ou des autres, hein. Et, euh, et la valeur, c'est après. Et c'est très contre nos, nos intuitions. Hein. C est, c est, ça, ça devrait être à l'inverse. <rire> mais, mais apparemment, ce n'est pas le cas. Et, euh, et c'est pour ça que je, je pense qu'au euh, final, on a tellement de valeurs euh, attachées à notre subjectivité, euh, à notre reconnaissance en tant que sujet euh, sociaux dans un monde qui n'est pas so seulement social, mais mais aussi, hein. euh, il est très important qu'on qu qu trouve la reconnaissance dans les jeux discursifs euh, de tous les jours euh, avec, euh, avec euh, les gens qu'on connaît, mais aussi dans, dans les médias sociaux, dans, dans, dans les médias en général, dans la politique, que, voilà, à tomber dans, dans des bulles euh, clos, close euh, des, des médias sociaux, euh, euh, à travers le temps, les, les gens s'enfoncent se, se, dans, 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 dans des, des châteaux de subtilité qui sont euh, un, 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 euh, très rigides et, euh, et du coup euh, il y a des énergies euh, très existentielles derrière qui nous poussent à, à trouver notre possession de sujet euh, voilà, sûr et, et protégé mais avec euh, les, les dynamiques discursives qu'on qu qu voit de nos jours, euh, on a juste euh, voilà, ces, 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 ces grands antagonismes 
là qui, qui nous permettent d'exister de, 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 en tant que voilà, euh, sujet. Je, je ne peux pas être euh, pour le Brexit euh, aujourd'hui, ce serait impossible. Hein. Je ne peux pas dire qu'il qu y ait quelque chose de bien dans tout ça. Euh, alors que je, je vois bien que la division entre, entre ces tribus-là, entre ces projets d'identité, peut être très dangereuse. Et du coup, euh, on est vraiment dans un dilemme. Et euh, il faut euh, amadouer un peu euh, voilà, les divisions, je ne sais pas comment, euh, sans renoncer à nos, à nos valeurs. Et euh, voilà, ce n'est pas évident. Oui, merci. Muito obrigada, merci. Ainda temos alguns minutos. Mais alguma pergunta, algum comentário? Moi, moi j'ai une petite curiosité, en fait, c'est par rapport à la thématique de la subjectivité. Comment, comment, est, est, comment est née cette... Euh, cette idée de... Parce qu'en fait, c'est une thématique qui a été surtout euh, mise en avant par Benveniste, comme vous l'avez souligné, mais elle a été quelque peu oubliée, en fait. Hein. Et, puis, et là, vous la remettez de nouveau en avant avec cette approche sociale. Et ma question, c'est d'où est venue donc, euh, cette curiosité et cette volonté de, de, de la discuter et de, de, de la creuser un peu plus en croisant les différentes approches dont vous avez très bien montré vous, vous voulez dire dans mon travail ou en général Oui, 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 dans, oui, oui dans votre travail. Euh, je pense que, voilà, j'ai senti que, voilà, il y a, il y a une discussion euh, en sciences sociales qui, euh, qui, qui m'a toujours été très chère euh, autour du tournant linguistique, euh, qui est quelque chose qui, qui n'a aucun sens, bien sûr, en linguistique, parce que. <rire> Qu'est-ce que serait le, le tournant linguistique en linguistique euh, Et du coup, euh, euh, j'ai essayé de, 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 de comprendre ce qui se passe avec, euh, avec ces folies de nos jours. Hein. Euh, les gens font des choses qui sont euh, rationnelles, euh, qui, qui créent des, euh, des relations de haine sans, sans que ce soit dans leurs intérêts. Et... Euh, euh, après, on se, se rend compte que c'est peut-être pas seulement euh, de nos jours, mais, mais peut-être surtout. Et, euh, et, euh, et, et je suis revenu à cette notion que, que j'avais regardée dans le livre que, que je montrais il y a, il y a pas mal d'années maintenant. Euh, et euh, je suis revenu là-dessus parce que euh, je serais très critique de voir une sorte de, de déterminisme social ici à, à l'œuvre. Euh, qu'on qu voit parfois même avec les, les, les sociologues bien réfléchis hein. il y a, je pense qu'il y, y a une limite par exemple à la, à la sociologie bourdusienne que, 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 que j'admire beaucoup euh, en ce que voilà il y, a, il, y a, il, y a, il y a un déterminisme parfois euh, qui, euh, qui est projeté sur ce que font ce que, ce, ce que préfèrent ce qu'ils ce qu veulent et les acteurs qui, qui me semble un peu exagéré et je pense que si on regarde euh, la subjectivité comme un problème euh, à la fois linguistique et social euh, on, on, on voit que voilà, c'est précisément un problème de, de voir la transparence euh, dans les échanges euh, euh, lingu linguistiques c'est quelque chose que, que les sociologues euh, ont tendance à, à, à ignorer hein, que le langage euh, serait voilà, euh, pas pas une fenêtre, mais plutôt voilà, une surface très opaque. Hein. Et, euh, et donc, euh, avec euh, toute cette discussion, euh, surtout avec, euh, avec euh, le Brexit et, euh, et les soi-disant populistes euh, qui, euh, euh, qui ont ressort des choses euh, depuis quelques années qui, 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 qui me semblent absolument euh, euh, surprenantes, euh, je me suis dit, il y a, il y a vraiment quelque chose... Euh, euh, au niveau de la subjectivité euh, qui, euh, qui serait à creuser. Et donc, euh, euh, je pense que l'autre chose aussi, euh, il y a une dimension psychologique ou affective hein, qui, qui est aussi dedans, psychanalytique, qui, qui est à mon avis très importante. Euh, et, euh, et donc, euh, je pense que c'est un carrefour euh, de connaissances, de, de problématiques 
euh, qu'il faut, euh, faut regarder de près. Donc, euh, euh, j'espère que vous voyez que c'est une invitation à, à aller plus loin. Oui. Euh, à, voilà. <rire> à Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Euh... Acho que estamos muito agradecidas e muito agradecidos por, por este momento. Uh, temos aqui o um comentário da Elsa Martins, que diz que está a agradecer que aprendeu muito. Então, ela há pouco aprendido, então, eu penso que é pendant ces, ces trois jours, uh, que ont été très riches. Uh, extremamente... E agradecimentos à comissão. Uh, quer dizer, isto é interessante, quer dizer que as próprias pessoas já estão a indicar que a sessão tem de encerrar e temos que dar por esta conferência plenária encerrada e iniciar, então, o encerramento. 